Ideme k exkluzívnej prezentácii ateliéru Kempe Till. Predtým ešte pár slov o tomto ateliéri. Andre Kempe a Oliver Till sú obaja pôvodom z východného Nemecka, sú bývalí spolužiaci z TU v Drážďanoch. Impulzom na založenie spoločného ateliéru v roku 2000 bolo víťazstvo v súťaži. Absolvovali ich už viac ako 200 a realizujú sa v Holandsku a Nemecku, ale aj Rakúsku, Belgicku, Egypte, Francúzsku, Maroku a Švajčiarsku. Je to veľmi silný príbeh spoločnosti. Vďaka triezvej architektúre s využitím klasických štruktúrálnych prvkov si na holandskej architektonickej scéne postupne vybudujú dávali naozaj rešpektovanú pozíciu. K najnovším prácam patrí napríklad dobytný súbor v Antwerpách, sociálne bývanie Montmartre v Paríži, sociálne bývanie Atrium House Tenever v Brémach, či rekonštrukcia kláštorného komplexu v švajčiarskom Kapel Am Albis. Aj o týchto témach určite bude hovoriť náš dnešný ďalší host. I believe that we are in connection now. Andre Kempe, good evening. Yes, hello, good evening. We are honored to have you here today with us and uh, we are looking forward to hearing your presentation and now we listen in. Okay. Now, thank you very much for the invitation. So it's a great pleasure uh, to be yeah, in Bratislava but not really unfortunately. So I try to share the screen now. Uh, can you see my screen? We can see it. Okay, great. Okay. <clears throat> so I, uh, wait, I have to, uh, no, I'm, I'm right. The lecture is called, the lecture is called prototypes because this is, um, somehow the way we are, we are working in our office and, um, yeah, it's, it's structured uh, along certain, uh, typologies of, of buildings. But maybe first some uh, introductory words uh, about our office. So the, the photo you can see here is our office in Rotterdam in the Netherlands, uh, where me and Oliver Till, we are living since 1996. And we started uh, this, this office in 2000. Originally, uh, we are coming from uh, East Germany, uh, from the DDR, um, uh, before uh, the wall uh, fell and before Germany was uh, united. Then in 1989, uh, East Germany was over and Germany was united. And um, what, what is maybe quite remarkable um, in relation to, uh, to Bratislava and, and uh, especially Czechoslovakia is that, uh, yeah, especially pr the city of Prague, I mean, not Bratislava, but the city of Prague was quite important for us as, a, as, as young people. So we were always traveling to, to, to Czechoslovakia because simply that was uh, one of the few countries where we could just uh, step into the train and, and go there. and. Uh, We very much liked it there and um, yeah Germany was unified uh, uh, after all this uh, communist period and uh, sadly enough uh, also for us uh, Czech Czechia and Slovakia were separated at that time so it was kind of touching for us because we also had uh, been growing up with um, Uh, these kind of things. I mean, I was maybe more interested into into uh, Spabel and Hovinek, uh, which are, as I know, from Prague, not from Bratislava. <clears throat> But what was also quite known in in, in East Germany was the Bratislavska Lyra. <laughs> Um, maybe not the type of music I was listening to, but uh, more the generation of our parents. So, um, yeah, that was kind of um, Eastern experience, which uh, which played a, a big role in, in my childhood and in my youth. So... So I have a, a kind of strong relationship mentally with with the East, um, and um, yeah, this this is still in fact the case. So I find it quite quite yeah sad not to come because I I've, I thought it's really nice to be again in an Eastern country after so many years. Um, so the, the 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 communist times uh, they kind of. Um, had a great impact on Oliver and me. So we, we were around our 20s, uh, beginning of our 20s when the wall fell and we had been grown up in this kind of uh, images, you know, this, this communist uh, sort of uh, optimism for the future. So it was always the future. Um, Zukunft means, means future in, in German um, towards a kind of yeah, time which, which never came, in fact, um, Uh, and uh, instead, there was a kind of um, yeah realism taking place, as you can see here on this in this postcard, 
which is uh, yeah quite amazing in the sense that it shows like hotels um, built in the Plattenbau uh, technology, so uh, prefab uh, elements, and they are showing exactly the same types of buildings as you see um, in, the, in the two photos below. Uh, and they are shown maybe with a certain proud, uh, maybe uh, with a kind of ironic uh, side comment. Uh, so it's not really clear, uh, but uh, it was our life uh, circumstance. It was our environment all the time. What's quite funny uh, concerning East and West Germany at that time is that if you look at the Wilfried Koch Baustilkunde, which is the yeah, the most important kind of yeah, collection of historic buildings uh, at this time when I was a student. Um, then, then the East German uh, architecture was uh, drawn. He, he, this, this guy drew everything. It's all drawings. Uh, this, this, this architecture was represented by this drawing only. So there were no perspectives. Normally he did, he did this kind of stuff, you know, very nice Gothic buildings, all it detailed very well with... Uh, all these refinements and everything, facades, spaces. But from the East German period, he, he only showed uh, this, a detailed section of the Plattenbau of the East German um, uh, prefab housing. Um, and it's just this, this connection between the, the facades and the, and the, and the floor plates um, as a kind of contribution of the, of the East Germans uh, towards uh, architecture. <clears throat> of course, there's a longer history, and I was also very much uh, affected by this uh, strong uh, German classicism, like from Schinkel, for instance, who was uh, also visible for us in East Germany, in East, East Berlin especially, or the Baroque uh, of, of the city of Dresden, which was quite important. Um, <clears throat> and then, um, yeah, of course, later we, we discovered uh, Mies van der Rohe, as um, a German who became very, very German when he had left Germany because of the Nazi uh, uh, dictatorship, which is also quite a funny uh, story. Um, we, we, as an office, we uh, try, um, yeah, in fact, to to yeah, realize an architecture which could be called uh, uh, maybe a kind of contemporary classicism. That's what we try to work to. Uh, so we try to see ourselves in the history of, let's say, 5,000 years at least, um, human, uh, yeah, high cultures, uh, architectural production. And, um, of course, we have facing uh, strong challenges uh, in this 21st century, uh, like the demographic and social changes, the digital society. We have an ecological crisis, neoliberal economy, and, and all that kind of stuff. So we have a lot of instable factors. Um, but we believe that uh, architecture is something, um, yeah, stable and ongoing, and uh, yeah, uh, kind of continues along a traditional line, a long traditional line which uh, has kind of produced architecture like this, for instance. This is uh, uh, the palace, uh, a palace in Rome um, from from uh, the Renaissance period, which is still a completely, um, yeah, flexible and adaptable building. Um, which is a timeless building in terms of its architecture. So that, that's for us something which is w w absolutely worth uh, achieving. Um, it's about uh, conceiving flexible and generous buildings, as, as you can see here in this collage from Mies van der Rohe, who kind of uh, discovered the uh, incredible spatial qualities of industrial buildings in the 1920s, 30s. And he just collaged in an, an art exhibition, uh, an exhibition a pavilion, um, which says a lot about, um, yeah, uh, the spirit of this time, but also the, the potential of this architecture, which still today uh, is there. We believe that uh, architecture, in the end, um, is always a, trans a transcendence of uh, of the banal, uh, of banality. And maybe a good example is this building, which is the Emperor Palace um, of the um, uh, Japanese Emperor in Kyoto, uh, the, the um, Katsura Rikyu, uh, which in the end is just a, a banal farmer's house with all its details. So all, all the normal traditional farmhouses in Japan are completely made like this. It's exactly the same. This palace is only bigger, of course, and maybe slightly more refined, a little bit only. But the basis is everything exactly the same. Um, we believe that uh, we have to make compact, uh, very deep buildings nowadays because uh, everybody's talking about ecology and whatever, but if you don't make compact buildings, you will never be completely energy efficient. Uh, and of course, you are also never really economic. So this is uh, the way to get um, a good architectural basis in all senses. 
uh, think big. Um, very often um, urban plans are set up in a way that they just fragment the city and believe that this is introducing a more, I don't know, refinement or human scale or something like that. So there's a lot of, we think, misunderstandings in that. Uh, I think, or we believe that um, thinking big, um, always trying to catch the, capture the bigger scale is just um, yeah, offering more possibilities, uh, giving you much more uh, possibilities. Um, capacity, space, views, and transparency, um, as you see here in this in this uh, photograph of one of our realizations, of our recent, recent realizations in, in Belgium, a school building, which I will present uh, later. Uh, of course, we believe that a rational set, uh, setup of architecture is still absolutely important and worth uh, doing because simply uh, if you set up architecture in a rational way, you uh, of course, um, save money on the structural basis and you can spend money on other things. So it's about uh, finding a, a logic in the um, yeah, split of the finances, where you put money, where you invest money on. Uh, it's about priorities in architecture. Great clear spans and load-bearing facades, so trying to avoid as much as possible columns in the inside um, of buildings. Um, and trying to make big clear spans because they offer much more generosity, much more flexibility uh, for the buildings. And that not only for public buildings, but for housing as well. So this, for instance, a housing project uh, we are on the way to realize now in, in Belgium, where we have the same uh, thing again, uh, trying to make plans which are completely open and flexible, that you can uh, like um, make totally different uh, plans, uh, flexible uh, separation walls and stuff like that. Knowing the technical possibilities, um, uh, trying always to make things more generous, um, greater, uh, and so on, because they will just uh, make the building look much more attractive and, um, and uh, just uh, nicer and more generous. Economy of means. Uh, in, the, in, the, in the past, uh, very often you find uh, buildings uh, produced in the past, in the Middle Ages, on the Renaissance. Uh, like, for instance, here, a totally normal, banal building in the city of uh, Naples, which I just, by coincidence, uh, passed by, um, which has a huge entrance gate, uh, which gives it such an enormous scale and at such um, yeah, cool proportions that you feel really welcome and uh, it's, it's giving value to its users and inhabitants, and this is a lot about uh, architecture. So maybe it's even uh, nearly all about architecture. Less is more, better uh, concentrate on um, certain things, on, on, on less things, and do them better. Uh, we believe that this is just a, um, a timeless kind of truth. So uh, elaborating on a detail in a very um, extended way uh, to, uh, to do it really well, and to um, yeah, just to to be very precise in your um, in your choices. Uh, we we kind of work always on uh, very simple concepts, which makes it also very often pos uh, impossible or, or difficult to win competitions nowadays because you have to play in interesting. In in in, in fact, uh, you have to do as if you are kind of um, yeah crazy. You you propose shapes and forms and whatsoever. We don't all do all that. We we propose generous, simple concepts uh, and elegant uh, details. And um, this combination, um, in the end, uh, speaks in the realized buildings uh, very much, um, but is communicated quite often quite hard in, in competitions. Materiality is, uh, of course, a very important topic for us as well. So we see a kind of, um, yeah, a kind of line uh, in the use of materials, uh, which is like uh, on the left side in this image, stone or concrete, which is maybe approaching real architecture, one could say. Um, and then you go more to the to the right to metal facades, um, uh, which are just cheaper. You know, if you have less, less money than you do metal facades, you're happy about it because you could sink lower and do uh, an ISPO facade, so kind of, uh, you know, the, the, the typical foam systems with a bit of, of, of stucco on, on the outside. Um, so, and then you can sink even deeper and do a, a foam facade with a polyurethane foam, which is uh, the cheapest way to insulate a building and to finish a building. So there's um, a kind of hierarchy in that, uh, in that sense. Um, we, we, we try to go for low-tech uh, in our architecture uh, and disassembled, disassembled materials because it's just better if you have, once have to transform the building later 
and we um, we we don't like at all uh, how the the term sustainability nowadays very often is used, uh, namely very often as a kind of technocratic, uh, very limited sort of thing where um, where uh, saving energy, uh, packing buildings into uh, yeah, making passive houses and stuff like that uh, means sustainability. So we believe in the largest sense of the word of sustainability, very classical, firmitas, utilitas, venustas, so this triangle dating back until the Roman Empire is, uh, we believe, um, still very important. We believe that uh, there's a st sustainability in form. Um, very often uh, form is used by architects in a way that, uh, yeah, you could really doubt it. Uh, so the form... Um, should be really proven. Um, you cannot always use round shapes. You cannot. You always use triangles and stuff like that. Um, very often, the rectangle, the square, are the forms which are the most adequate. Uh, and 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 there are moments where a round shape could play a role or make sense, like in this project would be you once did. Um, but that's uh, very often not the case. So we believe in an evolutionary evolutionary architecture in a historic uh, continuum. And um, so we, we see ourselves inscribed in this continuous stream of, of history. We work uh, on our uh, projects in a, in a systematic uh, typological research way. So we are kind of nearly like scientists. We are very, very systematic. And um, in the end, still, there's a lot of variation in these projects um, due to the circumstances where they, um, where they are created. OK, now uh, some projects. I start with uh, slab buildings. Uh, slab buildings, especially in the housing, um, still go on uh, playing an important role for us. And uh, we could recently realize uh, student houses um, in, in Berlin, where we were ha very happy with. So it's our first project in the city of Berlin for uh, the Bard College, which is an American school, American college, um, a private client in the end. And they didn't have much money um, and we could make, um, could make something uh, still cool, cool out of it, we believe. Uh, so we did a lot of, or we did some of slab buildings, like for instance, these, these houses in, in The Hague, in the city, uh, in the Netherlands. Um, and this is the student housing uh, I want to show you now. Uh, it's a small project, uh, but we really like it a lot. Um, you see here a little bit the conditions of the city of Berlin, uh, kind of wild, uh, trashy um, uh, atmosphere very often. It's in the city of, in the part of Pankow, um, but hardly any drawings or, or renderings, uh, only this sketch I, I once made to discuss it with the client. You see a little bit already the, the principle of the, of the project, uh, which I just explain uh, right away. Um, this, this is Pankow, um, uh, an area in the north of East Berlin, uh, consisting out of uh, a lot of single-family houses, little villas, um, yeah, uh, kind of that sort of loose urbanism stuff. And uh, the, the East Germans, uh, they built uh, in that area also the embassies of um, the countries who had an embassy in East Germany. So it's kind of wild mix of traditional kind of 19th century uh, stuff and uh, kind of East German modernism. And uh, we proposed to our clients to um, not make um, yeah, student housing with uh, single rooms, but to make apartments. So they live in small communities. And these apartments are like um, a duplex apartments, maisonettes, um, which are stacked on each other. So you can see here, the, the lower apartment is a duplex uh, accessed uh, by this little uh, pathway on the outside. Um, and uh, the uh, upper floor is a duplex apartment accessed by this uh, gallery. And then all these apartments have a double high space, a void space, in their living room. So these apartments are made to be students' apartments, but they, on the other hand, could also be used as family apartments, for instance, when the uh, college doesn't need uh, these apartments anymore, needs to sell them and, and stuff like that or maybe for young researchers with their families. Uh, so you can, uh, can introduce a certain flexibility for these, uh, for these houses. So you can see here the ground floor plan, the access uh, from the back side, the, the garden side via this path, and, and the front side, which is looking towards the street with the uh, double high spaces, the living rooms um, on, on this side. So you have a stair, you have these sleeping rooms, and so on. And then you have the, the upper level where you have uh, sleeping rooms, uh, sleeping rooms in the stair. You can look into this uh, void space. Construction was quite uh, conventional. Um, you can see here a photo uh, how it was made with a kind of sandstone um, 
stacking uh, system uh, and then uh, floor plates cast in, in situ and the whole uh, facade towards the street uh, set up in, uh, in concrete. So you can see here the double high space uh, and you see it here in the uh, executed version. You see the kitchen at the end, um, a table. You can uh, open one of these uh, windows. It's a huge lifting sliding window uh, within a really yeah, tight budget. Uh, quite interesting that uh, that worked out. So you can see here some uh, photos of this uh, of this project. At the head facades, you have uh, uh, windows uh, in the staircase where you have a kind of yeah, more rich uh, view relationship and so on. So you can see. This is one of the student rooms uh, towards the uh, street where you also have this huge lifting sliding door. And um, this is the side towards the, the back with the, with the path accessing uh, the lower levels. Um, normally in Germany, this is a front facade. So we were very happy that our client wanted to have um, you know, our type of, of architecture and, and just let us do um, what we find um, yeah, just very good and, and, and uh, quality. So another apartment, um, you have some, some apartments which have no void spaces at the uh, setback uh, volume. And here again with a head facade, um, this corner relationship with a view towards the outside. And everywhere in this area, you have these very, very nice strong trees, which give the area, of course, a, a very uh, cool character, very nice to integrate these uh, trees into the apartment. So they, uh, they um, are part, in fact, uh, of the spaces inside. Again, from the outside, um, a photograph. So you see the uh, the logic of the duplex apartments of the maisonettes uh, is also to be seen in the facade. Uh, you have always these big squares, and um, some some photos from the outside. Again, the head facade with the main entrance. So it's quite a, a yeah small, bit modernist entrance um, because there was no money. It was also very difficult to. Uh, yeah, to do more than this. So we invested all the money, in fact, in these void spaces and in the uh, big windows because we think this is a priority which is worth to, to, to fight for. We, we are working on this topic of the duplex apartments already quite a while. So we tried in the, in the 2000s already this project, for instance, in Zwolle in the Netherlands with the same idea, so stacking duplex apartments uh, on each other and having a huge winter gardens in that case. And um, now we were happy to, to build this uh, project in Berlin. Or for instance, here we, we tried uh, with duplex apartments in uh, Antwerp, um, stacking these apartments with huge fixed glazing of six meter high uh, in that case, and uh, doors uh, with uh, cladding on, on top. So we, we are always again coming back on these types and varying them. And there's always a new uh, yeah, kind of um, uh, thing being introduced. And, and that, that's the way how we work. Uh, the next category to present is uh, the urban villa typology. Urban villas, which are kind of very, very up-to-date, very hip now in, in, in all European cities, in fact. This is the, the urban model at the moment. Um, very politically correct, uh, good to be kind of phased uh, in economic terms. Um, yeah, it, it provides also always a, a, an urbanism which is which is kind of um, smooth and uh, nice uh, and uh, friendly. So we we, we kind of uh, worked quite a lot on, on this typology, and um, we discovered when we did it the first time that uh, in fact it has a quite interesting economic logic in itself. So you have to make a deep plan, as you see in the diagram here. You have to develop the apartments around a central core because then they all have views. Uh, uh, you provide them with a glass facade. So if the building is deep enough, then you can give it a glass facade everywhere. And if you have enough budget, you can add to the glass facade maybe a balcony or even a, a winter garden. So uh, you have to be super compact to, to do all this, uh, but that will be yeah, um, worth doing it because then you can achieve, for instance, a project like, like you see here, um, which is a student housing project in uh, Zwolle, in the city of Zwolle, in the north of the, of the Netherlands. And uh, uh, the, the, these were houses which were like uh, rent and sold. So there was a mix uh, and they were sold and rent uh, within two weeks or something like that. So. This, this kind of uh, price quality ratio we always try to uh, achieve. 
And uh, from this type, I would like to present you first this um, housing project uh, in Paris, where we were very happy that we could uh, win this competition. We won this competition in 2011, and we could realize the project until 2016 for a very low housing budget for uh, yeah, Paris circumstances of 1,450 euros per square meter, 50 apartments, a dentist, um, a mother child care center, a parking garage underneath. Uh, the client is the uh, the biggest uh, housing corporation in Europe, uh, Paris Habitat, uh, which has like, I think, 200,000 apartments. And um, we, we, we could build this, uh, this project, which you see here. And as you can already see, uh, it's a project where a winter garden is wrapped around all the building um, as a kind of basic conceptual idea. The project is situated in north of Paris at the uh, Port Montmartre, um, directly at the Boulevard Perferique. So you see here this black line is the Boulevard Perferique, uh, the, the ring uh, roadway around Paris. And in the neighborhood, it's quite interesting, um, you have these kind of uh, towers. Um, and this is exactly the same tower as uh, the Tour bois le Prêtre, which has been uh, renovated and transformed by the uh, French office Lacaton Vasal. And um, which is absolutely amazing uh, because um, Tour Bois Le Prêtre is quite close to our project as well. So it's like five minutes by bicycle or something like that. And um, uh, Paris Habitat, which is the same client as our client, uh, who is the owner also of these uh, housing towers from the 60s, gave commission to uh, Lacaton Vasal uh, when they won the competition to transform this to Tour Bois Le Prêtre, a kind of housing tower. And um, when we won the competition, uh, there was the discussion that this building, nevertheless, or unless uh, Lacaton Vasal had already uh, nearly finished their project, uh, this tower still should have been demolished. Because, uh, yeah, they just wanted to have maybe one of these towers and for the rest they wanted to get rid of them still. So the idea was that these people from this tower should temporarily move in our project to demolish the tower. So quite uh, quite an amazing uh, story. So in the end, they didn't move in our in our project, but they still demolished uh, this uh, this project, which is quite um, yeah contradictory uh, to my point of view. There's other contextual elements uh, in the area, namely these uh, houses from the interbellum period, so the 1920s, uh, very solid, um, high quality uh, housing projects uh, built in brick. And, and some some story about uh, the design process. So in the competition, we we analyzed uh, I think something like thirty five uh, French housing projects. It was the first time we had a housing competition in France, um, and we had to learn, of course, uh, from scratch uh, how it works in France, which is completely different than in other countries. Uh, like in every country in Europe, it's completely different. And um, we we just analyzed all these projects to to get the rules to understand the rules and then um, started with uh, several uh, versions and in the end we ended up with the built version two uh, plots two urban villas uh, the most compact uh, which we could could achieve um, and as compact uh, that we could uh, like permit ourselves to put, uh, put a winter garden all the way around and give the project more quality. Give it also more generosity because if you do less volumes, you have like one generous outside space between the volumes and you offer views between the buildings uh, for the neighboring buildings. So you see here, of course, in Paris, everything is packed very densely. Everything is very, very um, high density everywhere. And um, then you're happy to have some generosity uh, in the environment. So here you can see the the two buildings. Uh, the right one, the rectangular one, is the, the housing prototype, one could say, for the French circumstances. Um, and um, we, we had really um, yeah, developed, we had tried to push to develop this plan. Uh, and uh, in the end, we because it was very difficult, you know, in, in Holland, you can make plans much, much deeper because you can do kitchens in the back. Uh, but in France, you have to make the kitchen in the facade, which you can see uh, here. Um, you also uh, are like um, kind of condemned, you could say, uh, to respect a certain um, yeah, measure for the sleeping rooms, uh, which is much more than, for instance, in the Netherlands. Uh, and all these kind of circumstances make it that the building can be only 20 by 20 meters. So this is like scientifically proven, uh, 20 meter by 20 meters is the maximum for this type of building in, in France uh, for one core. So if you want to make it longer, for instance, you have to make two cores, but you can never make it longer and wider at the same, same, same moment. It's, it's just not possible. 
And, and uh, with the kitchen story, we, we thought, yeah, what can we do with this kitchen? And uh, we, in the end, thought, okay, we make this idea type of building, which you can see here. And we put the kitchen in the corner, <clears throat> which is the most noble space, of course, of this building. You have the best condition for the views. Uh, and uh, we thought this is good because um, the French kitchen, the, the French love uh, cooking, and they should have a very valuable place, maybe the most valuable place of the whole apartment to make their uh, nice uh, meals. And uh, this, this was one story. And the other story was that uh, with this setting, we could uh, spatially um, uh, make uh, give give more generosity to the living room because the living room opens up towards the kitchen when the sliding door is open. And by that, you can give these small apartments more generosity, more views, more complexity. Um, and it's just uh, nice also in combination also with these outside spaces, these um, these winter gardens. And this type of building here was a kind of adapted uh, version of it uh, with a diagonal line to just connect with the uh, with the existing uh, buildings uh, next to it. So you can see this concept of the winter garden, um, which is like a visual extension of, of, of the building, but also a spatial extension of, of all these apartments. And of course, a climate idea, namely to buffer in the winter situation uh, that is not getting that cold uh, and in the summer situation, of course, to keep the heat a bit more outside. So also in this winter garden, we have like um, uh, curtains, um, sun reflecting uh, curtains, which protect against uh, the summer sun. Then the building, uh, the building started, and the building was uh, the building process was uh, quite an adventure uh, as such, <clears throat> quite amazing, uh, because um, yeah, it was in fact the, the most adventurous, most weird uh, building process uh, we had uh, had uh, until now. You can see here already uh, how they start to. To, to, to dig the ground and they don't dig until the very, very deepest point. So they just dig locally and then they dig out the rest. So quite an amazing uh, technique. Everybody confirmed us that this would be the most uh, economic uh, version. I, I still cannot believe it, but that's the way how they work and it, it seems to be very efficient. Uh, the quality of the building uh, was quite difficult as well. So we had to really, we went there very often to, to survey the building uh, site and uh, we had to correct uh, things like you see here, a lot of uh, pipe work, uh, which is cast into the concrete. And uh, you see here in these spaghetti, which are having maybe a little bit of uh, electric cables sometimes inside, but for the rest, uh, especially air, that the acoustics and also the, the fire stability and also the structural stability is a bit doubtful maybe. So we had to push the contractor always to rearrange these things and not uh, to mess it up. Uh, as they very often did here in the concrete as well. So you see here um, a fresh cast concrete wall, which had to be repaired. Uh, sometimes walls had to be demolished. Sometimes we had to call the structural engineer uh, to ask him if, if we should not demolish because the quality was just uh, too bad. Uh, the building was uh, built by nearly 100% Africans, which didn't speak any word of uh, French. Uh, so they spoke uh, whatever, but not French. Uh, so the communication within the team was quite complicated. And uh, between us and the, the building uh, team was, was also quite uh, complicated. We had uh, like uh, prefabricated the whole project. Uh, we had made like manuals, like you see here for, from, from IKEA, you know, that you can assemble the whole thing like an IKEA, IKEA cupboard. But in the end, uh, a lot of things were done uh, just uh, in situ. So the whole uh, culture of, um, of prefabrication where France was a kind of pioneering country in the 60s, 70s, seems to be completely gone, at least if you uh, look at this uh, experience. So they, they made everything then in place with a circular saw, they cut the wood and, and, and so on. So in this circumstance, we had um, uh, negotiated with the clients uh, in, the, in the study phase that we want to make a balconies uh, just made from concrete cast uh, in situ as, as prefab elements. And we had believed that uh, like in the Netherlands, you can get a, a good quality and uh, our client at the time uh, when we did the study work already had looked at us as if we were a bit uh, crazy. Um, and then when we saw the, the quality of the concrete, we, we understood why they always had doubted uh, our idea. So we, we had to make these balconies, make these balconies now with this team where we had just seen the, the quality of the, um, of, the, of the concrete work. And we 
Um, we in the end managed, uh, even with quite good quality. So we had taught them uh, and they had learned together with us how to make the concrete. And what was especially funny, they were casting the concrete plates uh, in situ. So they had delivered uh, molds and they were casting them in the courtyard and then lifting them up with a crane, putting them into the, um, into the uh, existing I insulated part of the building, which were, was cast completely in situ, and then they were assembling uh, assembling the prefab element together with the cast in situ uh, core element. What you can see here is the um, uh, the um, uh, this, this 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 pointy corner and the rails uh, of the winter garden uh, glazings. The winter garden elements were also a story, an adventure as such, in the sense that. Um, in the sense that uh, as such, such a product did not exist on the French market. So you, you find it in Germany or in Switzerland, for instance, you find solar looks uh, in Austria, also you find a product uh, which works, but all these products were not certified for the French condition. So in, in France, you have a completely um, own system of, of, of labels, of, of guarantees, of, of regulations, and then uh, a new product had to be developed. And we, we had to work with a public a project, of course, with a public tendering, uh, public procurement, in fact, and luckily um, the winning uh, enterprise um, had taken uh, Technal, which is a, which is a French um, uh, kind of uh, yeah, a profile firm of, of extruding uh, aluminium profiles. And uh, they were very happy to have the opportunity to develop uh, an own winter garden system on the basis of this project because there was enough glass. So it's all wrapped around. So there's a lot of square meters of, of glass. And it was enough to develop uh, an entire uh, window system just for this project. And now it has become part of their catalog of, of standard uh, elements. So you can see here a little bit the, the context. Um, it's quite poor. It's quite close to the Porte de Clignancourt um, uh, flare market where you can see all these guys uh, running around with stuff to, to sell also on the streets around. So quite a problematic area. And we, we like that a lot because we think that social housing should be uh, um, not, um, uh, not discriminating, uh, the opposite. Uh, so social housing should be noble and should, should also be maybe even confused with uh, luxury housing. So that that's what, what is really the case. So you see this this building in this context, and it's it's kind of uh, kind of funny um, because it's not not at all looking like social housing uh, at first glance when you when you see it. Also funny, uh, the interior wall. So this is a separating wall between a sleeping room and uh, a corridor, and we had drawn the whole project with uh, seven centimeter wide uh, walls. Um, in Germany, they use ten centimeters. In Holland, it's seven centimeters of massive plaster blocks, for instance, or kind of um, uh, plaster board. And the, the French always were laughing at us, yeah, that we drew these, these walls which were thicker than the standard uh, for them. The standard for them is five centimeters, and then this, this is what you see here. It's like two plates of MDF, uh, and they are separated just by air, nothing inside, and they're happy with that. So acoustically, it's, of course, much less than uh, in other countries, but um, apparently they know to how to behave in their apartments. They don't make so much noise, so they were very happy with that. And we had to change it into these five centimeter thick walls because otherwise we would not have managed in the end uh, to get the right square meters. So we had to just cut off these two centimeters uh, even from these walls to get into the administratively demanded square meters of the apartment. Some photographs, uh, you see here the, the standard windows for the sleeping rooms. This is the situation between living room and kitchen. So the kitchen is in the, the corner. And uh, yeah, some other um, views. It's always very nice because you can look across through these uh, apartments or through the corners. This is the very pointy one with the living room in the corner. And here with uh, people living inside. And the cat, of course, wanted to be on the photograph, always moving around. Um, and so on. So. <clears throat> And we, we go on with this, for instance, um, th this is uh, again uh, actually quite a comparable type of building in, in the city of Hasselt uh, for a developer. And the developer, they wanted to have Paris-style apartments, which was very funny, but in this, in this case for sale. So this is now under construction and it will be um, in some ways comparable, but in some ways also a bit different. 
Um, this is a very flexible plan. So these are these drawings from, from this project um, where there's no fixed separation walls and so on. And as a uh, next category, I want you uh, to show uh, tower buildings, um, actually a type of building where we several times worked on, like for instance, in this project in Almere, which had been canceled uh, due to the crisis in 2010, where we lost like five big projects in the, in the Netherlands, um, where we tried to, to make such a, a tower building with setbacks, because we think uh, this is a good way to make something which is uh, kind of yeah, unified typology, not a fragmented typology, but still a kind of um, entity, but varied in the volumetry, or for instance here, a student housing um, in Groningen, also a tower type uh, with uh, setbacks, with terraces. So it's also a topic we really like a lot. Um, or other towers like we proposed here in Antwerp, uh, also a competition we had lost. Um, in this case with uh, prefab concrete uh, balconies. And we, we have the, the first chance now to build a tower in uh, Rennes, in the city of Rennes in France, where we're also very active. Um, 250 apartments for sale and then also uh, office buildings, two office buildings next to it, uh, next to it um, for a um, con contractor and developer, which is of course difficult, um, for a very low budget as well. And it's situated in the city, in the city center of the city of Rennes, uh, just close, directly close to the to the main train station. So the the train uh, uh, tracks and the platforms are right uh, in face of our buildings, uh, uh, as, as you can see here on this image, and um, a very pointy situation. So this is an office building you see here in front, with a big cantilever. Another office building in here in the back, you see this housing tower. And what you can see here is an axonometry where you see already that it has something special with the shape of these buildings, um, which is due to the, to the urban uh, plan near the ground floor, how the project is like um, yeah, rooted in the, in the city. The, the ground floor is with restaurants, restaurants and shops and an entrance for the parking garage, which is underneath. Um, uh, the two office buildings with flexible office spaces, um, typical plan, you could say, uh, core in the middle and then facade wrapped all the way around. And here you can see the facade detail, which in the end was the idea which made us win this competition, uh, because the urbanist, um, uh, who is Philippe Gazot, quite a known French architect uh, in France, um, uh, wanted to have uh, all the buildings in this uh, development around Central Station as a uh, yeah, kind of uh, shapey stuff, you know, kind of uh, uh, shaped buildings with kind of weird forms. And we were like breaking our heads, what the hell can we do with this? Because it's not at all our type of architecture, not at all our philosophy, how to make architecture. And um, at a certain moment, we had this intuition to say like, yeah, okay, we could step back these uh, apartments or these these buildings at each level so each level 15 centimeters setback 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 and by that we can create a kind of non uh, rectangular shape and this non, non rectangular shape makes sense because it lets more light into the distance between the buildings and um, more views as well and it offers on each level a little balcony because of this setback so you can step out of your house and, and be on your balcony and uh, so that, that made sense for us and um, we could convince them and we, we won this competition. So, <clears throat> and uh, of course then it's again combined with this total flexibility. So you have a core, a load bearing um, core in the middle and a load bearing facade all the way around. And uh, a lot of variety in these floor plans uh, inside um, and a very, very complex typology. So it looks simple on the outside, but super complicated in the inside because it's not only stepping back, it's also like type several types of, of, of programs. So you have the parking, you have the commercial spaces, you have a kind of um, student housing in this area. You have social housing here in this area and you have uh, housing for sale on these uh, top apartments. The terraces here, they are due to the urban rules. <clears throat> And give, of course, a special quality to, to these apartments there. So you can see the variety uh, of, of apartments 
which is, is quite uh, different, all, all of them. And the construction started where we were very happy with, so there was a very complicated design process. And uh, the contractors now are going on to, to build up um, uh, the project. Uh, so there were mock-ups already, as you see in, in this, this photograph, concrete elements uh, stacked uh, on top of each other with beams and, and columns and so on. <clears throat> quite complicated to get it really waterproof, of course, uh, to get it stable. Um, how can you just uh, connect uh, all these uh, armaments uh, in, in, the, in the concrete and so on. So that's how the project then should look like, as you can see here um, in some of these images. Um, these three volumes coming out of the program and the urban plan. So you see these shapey buildings in the neighborhoods where we were really like, yeah, we don't like that stuff. We don't want that. And how the hell can we react on this? So you can see directly facing the platforms of the main station with all the uh, TGV trains um, facing them. And as a last category, I would like to uh, show you um, a courtyard project. Um, and um, no, it's not true. There's another one. I think we have atrium projects too. So we have food court apartments uh, in Antwerp. Um, one of these uh, housing projects we could realize in the city of Antwerp in Belgium, um, uh, if also for a quite low uh, budget. Apartments for sale, shops, restaurants, a parking garage, offices for a developer, a very, very cultivated developer who is building uh, the biggest housing project in Belgium, uh, namely this area here, which is has like uh, 2,200 apartments. And they make a collection uh, of architects there. So it's uh, like Peter Zumthor is even building there. They don't, um, they are not afraid on Peter Zumthor even, you know, um, and so on. So th this is our project, what I will show you now more in detail. Um, in a model uh, as we conceived it in the beginning, this is the city of Antwerp um, with our project here in this new neighborhood. So all this is built by one and the same developer, Triple Living. And we're really happy with them because they, they are really very, very cultivated uh, clients and uh, they kind of really love architecture and want to do something uh, of high quality. So you see here the, the neighborhood, our building is on the main square of this new neighborhood, which is also cool, of course, to build the main building on a, on a square. <clears throat> and of course, this is also demanding, challenging. How can you just react on this uh, on this square? Uh, the, the plan of the project, um, very difficult in the sense that it's a plot of uh, 45 by 45 meters. And it's, it's just a little bit too small to make a real courtyard. Um, and it's just too big to make it as an urban villa, uh, so to fill it up entirely with apartments or something like that. So it's, it's quite interesting. And, and then uh, how, how many cores, access cores, do we need to, to exceed it, uh, access it in an, in, an, in an efficient way? So we made like four. Each corner, each inner corner has one uh, access uh, core with elevators and, and, and staircases. And this was actually the most uh, efficient uh, way to, to, yeah, to, to design this building. The ground floor with um, commercial spaces and then the entrance space of the development company. So it's their headquarter actually, Triple Living, our client, they, they are having now the headquarter in this building. Um, and then you see here their, their office. So they, they wanted to have open, in Belgium, they, people always want to be open-minded and, and uh, uh, innovative um, and they wanted to have some open space and in the end they, they just ended up with having a corridor with left and right um, yeah, normal office spaces. Only the corners are completely open which is giving uh, quite a good um, yeah, backbone to the, to the spatial setup of the, of the project. And then you see the housing, um, one of these housing floors, the, the lower closed floor uh, which is completely a ring going all the way around. And you see that the houses have different um, X measures, which, which is quite difficult, of course, architecture-wise. And what we introduced as an idea was, okay, the client wanted to have all this variation in the plans in terms of sizes, um, but we want to have an architecture on the outside, which is kind of equal, which is kind of... Um, yeah, not depending on all the mess happening behind, let's say. So we corrected uh, these dimensions, which were a bit messy to our point of view, with the winter gardens, uh, which have a regular measure here, and only the corners are wider, which is also good, giving the building much more generosity. 
so you have then the situation that um, the, the, the balconies were democratized, you could say. So everybody has the same balcony except for those guys in the, in the corner apartment, which have a huge balcony. So the balconies are 2 meter 50 deep, which is super generous, of course, and giving all these apartments um, a very... Uh, individual kind of uh, outside space uh, and giving giving it even the feeling that you have your own house like in these corner apartments they they are really yeah not so far away from individual um, uh, freestanding villa kind of, of living which is actually also one of these things which interests us how can we introduce in um, collective housing in the cities uh, suburban qualities uh, actually the stuff everybody was looking for when he was moving out of the cities into nature. So how can you improve this quality to a maximum in, in, in the housing? So then uh, the volume steps back. So we are on plus three and then we have like huge uh, outside terraces for these apartments here. And that goes on until the last floor where you have again here a kind of really nearly freestanding villa kind of apartment. Um, pergolas, as you see here, are giving uh, sun shading uh, on these huge outside terraces. Uh, in in section, it works like this. So you see this uh, terraced type of, of building. You see the the upper floors have higher uh, heights in these in these loggias in these balconies, uh, which is giving the uh, the architecture of the building, the appearance of the total building, of course, uh, a different quality. At the same time, uh, it's also very cool, of course, for these apartments, and at the same time, it's creating balustrades for the uh, terraces uh, on the next level. So it's also a synthetic idea of architecture. <clears throat> you see the courtyard, you see an underground parking garage of three stories, which is of course amazing. Amazingly complex also. Also this is a very hybrid typology. It looks simple, but it's super complicated to stack these things on top of each other. At the entrance of the parking garage, you, you enter here and you have a view uh, through the entire building because this is a big window here where you can look into the courtyard. Um, again, a project with prefabricated concrete. So you see here the molds uh, of the concrete um, being produced uh, from a Dutch uh, subcontractor who is doing very good quality. And um, you see here these uh, prefab elements uh, waiting to be transported on, on the side. And the client wanted to have, for the closed parts of the facade, a natural stone. And we were searching for a natural stone, which is like very much fitting to the concrete. So you see here underneath, you see down here the concrete column. And you see here on top a mock-up of the natural stone, which is looking nearly like the concrete. Uh, what we liked a lot, so uh, to unify as much as possible this, this uh, materials to give it a very smooth and uh, calm uh, character. So you see here the project under construction uh, seen from the uh, towers next to it. And uh, then the project as it's finished. So you have these, these big balconies which are kind of uh, being wrapped all the way around the building and uh, making the facade of the building uh, and giving it a, a clear topic. Uh, and of course these generous outside spaces which are valued a lot uh, from, the, from the inhabitants. So you see the ground floor and the first floor. First floor with the office spaces. And again, uh, some photographs, these uh, stepping terraces. Again, the outside. And of course, you have this pergola also on the ground floor, giving sun shading also to the office spaces. And the courtyard. It's a uh, compact courtyard and uh, gallery access uh, going all the way around for uh, quite luxury housing, actually uh, expensive housing, quite a challenge. So the client in the end agreed on that because um, otherwise we would, we could, we, we, we needed more cores to, to access the, the building. And uh, the, the galleries, they only, um, you only, only have to pass by one apartment in, in the middle apartment. So it is an, a gallery which is quite, yeah, quite modest in the end and very short and also very generous, very wide. So the galleries have a width of also 2 meter 50, which is super large and uh, it's not feeling at all yeah, that you are disturbed when you're one in one of these sleeping rooms when somebody is passing by. So architecture is a lot about uh, scale, about proportions, um, if things are acceptable or not. So that's also one of the things, uh, one of the lessons always uh, to be learned um, from that. So the entrance of the developer's office, as you can see here, with a 
special cast in situ uh, staircase, so they wanted to have a sculptural staircase as an access stair. And this is one of these open corners in the office space, um, which uh, which is uh, yeah, kind of giving a special uh, backbone. So specially designed doors for the for the office spaces. And again, the gallery access for the apartments. You can see here this natural stone facade and the, the width of the facade and this uh, collective terraces here um, for yeah for the use of, of all these people who are living in there. And private terraces uh, that are new, really super huge. They are bigger than the houses sometimes uh, themselves, as you can as you can see here. So you look through these apartments. Um, and they give really this impression of being in a one-family house nearly. Smaller apartments, uh, you can entirely open the facade. You just slide the sliding doors away on this uh, shift uh, uh, to, to correct the, um, uh, the, the balcony logic to, uh, with, the, with the logic of the apartments. So also here, again, a practical, uh, practical thing uh, unified with this um, architectural cor correction of the appearance. Roof uh, apartment again with huge outside spaces. And also, this topic we try to develop further. So, like in this project, what we are building now in uh, Filforde, which is a city uh, north of uh, Brussels, we, we just reintroduced this topic of the, of the stepping terraces here as a main feature towards the canal. And here, for even more luxury housing, and the balconies are even bigger and deeper, and uh, and so on. So it's it's quite amazing that we are now asked for also luxury housing, what we what we of course like a lot too, um, where you can just uh, yeah you have more possibilities to to work on it. And as a last uh, category, atrium uh, buildings, um, Junkie Hotel in Amsterdam um, was one of the first we could build. Uh, was a hotel for uh, drug addicts. Um, and uh, the, I think it's the last project, oh, no, it's not the last, the, the second last, uh, St. Lucas School of Arts in Antwerp, um, which is an art school in the city of Antwerp. Um, here again, the map of Antwerp is situated here um, with an existing building that had to be partly demolished, partly transformed and renovated um, and um, kind of combined with a new structure, which you can see here. Um, with an atrium space, um, renovation of this existing building, um, opening up a typical renovation part, um, and then the atrium building, what you see here, this new uh, construction uh, in a model, um, which is serving uh, for the artists as ateliers, uh, but also for exhibition, as you can see here. So the space is as generous as, as possible, um, open as possible, um, and before uh, before it was finished, they wanted to put uh, separation walls. When they saw the uh, structure, uh, when it was finished, um, they, they thought, yeah, we leave away the walls and we keep it entirely open. So we, we were very happy with that, of course. So you can see, see, see some impressions of the, of the use of the spaces when the students uh, make their exhibitions. This is the atrium as a kind of collective uh, space in the middle, unifying all these activities and giving still variation uh, to, the, to the space. Used as a museum, as a school, and they are super flexible and, and happy with that kind of um, opportunities. And yeah, some, some impressions um, again outside. Uh, it's, it's another project with kind of corrugated sheet facade and glass. So here we could not manage to, to pay uh, natural stone, for instance, so we used this uh, corrugated sheets. And you see how, how the light system works, it's always these, these uh, light bands, these, these glass bands going all the way around. So even the, the basement, uh, what you see here underneath, has, has the same light condition as the spaces uh, above. And as a large project, the T2 building, uh, which is a, a big professional school in the city of uh, Genk, in Flanders also, in Belgium, um, which um, is very much inspired by, uh, for instance, buildings like this in Sao Paulo, uh, buildings with huge atrium spaces where a lot of students can unify, where uh, actually, actually all the people being in the building uh, kind of uh, unified. 
um, uh, or for instance, um, buildings like, for instance, the Bo Boeing uh, factory, the Boeing production, which is teaching uh, and uh, producing at the same time. The project in Genk, uh, which is a mining city in Belgium, uh, on a on a an old a former coal mine, uh, stone. Uh, how is it called? Um, yeah, just a coal mine. Um, and in a master plan, what you can see here, where all these plots are filled now, step by step, where we could build already another project uh, here, and now this project over there. Um, as a huge industrial hall in this park, a super deep building, so it's like 100 by 150 meters, so it's the deepest building we could ever made until now, and still a super, super open and, and, and glazy uh, building. With, of course, a super flexible structure with huge clear spans, um, and uh, the, the school part, the theory part, on top of this industrial shed, which is underneath for the practical uh, teaching of the, of the students, and in section you can can see it here. So in the middle um, you have the the school part uh, with the atrium space in the middle, and then you have the practical part, like wings on left and on right uh, for teaching, becoming a becoming a, a carpenter, for instance, and in professions like that. The uh, main atrium is a as a social connector. So you can see here the longitudinal section with the uh, yeah cascading uh, staircase. Um, some, some model photo structure is at the same time architecture. Um, yeah, some uh, images. 85% of prefabrication, so the, the building was uh, built very, very quickly. Integration of technical installations, so everything was prepared, uh, all the openings uh, for, the, for the duct work. Structure is nearly architecture, so you can see here already how the building will look like in the end. And then it's all like covered with glass. Uh, so the building was so efficient, uh, unless the building budget was so low uh, that with uh, with these huge fixed glazings, it's like five meter high glass panels, we could just uh, uh, kind of uh, finish the whole building. Then there's a pergola on the outside, which is giving uh, sun shading uh, to the glass facade. Some doors. Um, Pergola again, um, going all the way around um, and giving uh, character, of course, also to this building. So you see the, the theory part on top with the same pergola, but a little bit smaller. And then we go into the inside where you see uh, how this works. So this is uh, an education space for electricians. Um, um, completely open, it looks even as if the landscape um, enters the, the project. And of course, um, the atrium space is as is, is a big social contact connector, you could say, with gallery access uh, all the way around. And as you see behind the stair, um, uh, yeah, and you, you have, of course, the opportunity to organize mass events. So they do teaching uh, uh, and conferences and stuff like that. Of course, not with the corona now, but um, before the corona and after the corona, that, that will work again as a kind of social uh, place also for other events than the school. So in the evening and the weekends, they can also rent it for other events. And uh, a huge restaurant, which is integrated in this atrium space as a generous kind of uh, thing. Um, yeah, just um, being uh, uh, as, as yeah, offering as much, uh, much as possible social uh, contacts. Special niches for individual uh, discussions. And you can look through the entire building. It's all glazed towards the inside, towards the outside, uh, to give it as much as possible transparency and communicative uh, yeah, uh, possibilities. So you learn, uh, in fact, in this park, uh, you have everywhere the view to the park. And this within a budget which is completely yeah, low, in fact. So that uh, was my presentation. I hope I didn't make it too long. Ďakujeme pekne z Dní architektúry a dizajnu. Ste si vypočuli prezentáciu Andreho Kempeho. Mr. Kempe, thank you very much. Uh, thank you for talking to us. It was amazing time with you. Thank you for that. It's, it's a pleasure, of course. So. <clears throat> Can you close your presentation, please? We would like yes. to see you again. Yes, 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 yes. And we have a couple of questions for you from our viewers. And here with me, 
I have Alexandra. She's a part of the closest circle uh, preparing this festival. And she has a special message for you. Yeah, so I'm going to read it for you now. <laughs> Hi, Andre. I'm Stefan, co-organizer of this festival and architect of Good Good Studio in Bratislava. We are together in European Five Book. We want the East Slovakian side while you the one in Rotterdam. And he's asking if it was hard for you to start your practice in foreign state and to move your company from the East Germany there. Now, in fact, in fact, you know, I mean, when, when Oliver and me, we were as students in, in Germany, especially in East Germany, <laughs> um, we, we kind of uh, were still in this young age, you know, uh, the wall had, uh, had fallen in 89, we started studying in 90, we were full of energy, and of course, all that what happened in East Germany after the unification of Germany, was not at all interesting. I mean, there was nothing interesting happening except for maybe Berlin. Um, and um, yeah, some some few things, but the main developments were kind of very commercial bullshit, you know? So it was not at all nice and we, we were not at all motivated to stay. We had studies in, studied in Paris, uh, we had studied in Tokyo uh, as students and we just run away when we had finished in, in 96, escaped uh, quasi to, to Holland. Uh, to work for other offices and we were, yeah, we had a lot of drive, you know, and we just started uh, our own firm. We, we had one European as young guys, uh, this, this competition for young architects. Um, and um, we were very, very motivated to just go on. And of course, yeah, of course it was very hard, but when you're young, you don't care, you know, just just give a shit and you just go for it and uh, you, you you just do your stuff. And uh, that, that's what we did as well. So we, uh, we were full of ideas and thought, yeah, we will manage. And in the end, we did manage until now. So we exist now since 20 years. And um, of course, there were phases in the beginning where we thought, oh, now that the bank account is running completely empty. And of course, we, we could not pay ourselves salaries uh, for, I think, five years or something like that. You know, so we had to live from, from savings we had saved before. But coming from the East, you knew how to, <laughs> how to get along with little stuff, you know. So, uh, and Rotterdam was a cheap city at that time, very cheap. So... It is, um, yeah, we, we didn't find it hard, you know, we found it motivating and it was a big discovery, a big adventure, so. He has also another question for you. If you're changing the strategy of proposing depending on the country, he sees the difference between the projects, for example, in France, when comparing them to ones in the Netherlands. Mm -hmm. They're more like, he thinks they're more elegant in a way. <laughs> now you know well I, I don't know if they're more elegant <laughs> maybe they are I mean it's up to you to judge uh, uh, I hope they were both elegant but uh, <laughs> um, now the, 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 that, that's a very interesting one because um, we, we discovered that um, it's, it's interesting to react on different cultural um, circumstances you know so uh, when we started the Nether in the Netherlands we intuitively kind of um, made uh, what we saw in the Dutch architecture, you know? So we kind of, of course, everywhere you go, you have your own projections, you know? You think like, ah, oh, that's what it is. You have your, your cliches, your, your ideas in mind. And the Netherlands for us was um, huge windows, nearly nothing else but windows, framed by uh, sometimes a little bit brick as these um, buildings from the... 17th century in Amsterdam, you know, these, these Krachten uh, uh, buildings, um, which were already very light buildings, big windows, um, no curtains. Uh, so this was for us the Netherlands, uh, and we tried to sort of uh, accelerate that, you know, we kind of um, cultivated this kind of uh, architecture. So we, we made more out of it than the Dutch themselves, let's say, you know. So that was our, our strength, that we could come, al we, we come along as foreigners and we see something else or something more in the local architecture than the locals themselves, uh, to, to call the people like that, you know. And um, that, that's actually what, what, what makes us also, yeah, going on with this journey uh, through Europe where we can discover all these European cultures uh, like, for instance, in Belgium, it's completely different than in France, than in Holland, than in Germany. Um, and uh, that, that's, that's quite amazing because you always have to try at least to understand the culture where you try to um, yeah, invade, you could say, where you try to build your building, uh, design your building. 
because you have to, you have to find a way to communicate with the with the others you know uh, which are different than you and uh, this this is actually for us um, a driving force uh, for creativity because in this uh, way we can offer something uh, what um, neither we alone nor the others alone would have achieved for instance in france does it does that mean then it's it's a catholic uh, country it's a more traditional context but still they want to be modern but they want to be more protected you know they want to be more um, yeah, uh, kind of uh, with a buffer zone, you know. In, in Holland, they're very exposed, you know. They, they like it to have a big window directly towards the street. And in the, in the more uh, southern context, uh, I, I just have to put on, the, put on the cable. I see my, my uh, accu is running empty. Yeah, go ahead. Uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. I'm sorry. <laughs> you know, and um, that, that, that's quite interesting because um, in, in this Catholic context, uh, people like to have this buffer space. And that's why we, when we did the competition for this Paris project, we, we thought like, ah, then we, we have to introduce a, a winter garden as a buffer space, you know. And of course, it gives the opportunity to make a glass architecture with a lot of views, but it's not the first line. You're not exposed directly towards the public space. And uh, this was like uh, this was like just working very well, you know. We we had found a method to communicate with the French, and um, that was quite uh, quite uh, actually actually quite good. Yeah. And what was also amazing was that you could achieve it, could you afford it, you know. You could pay this winter garden all the way around, so their budget uh, permits to 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 pay this. I mean, the Dutch budgets were very much lower, you know. In, in Holland, we built for 850 euros per square meter, and this Paris project is for 1,400. And of course, there is everything is a little bit more expensive, but not that much. So in terms of um, price quality ratio, it was possible to just finance this winter garden all the way around. And um, it's also about that, you know, analyzing budgets, understanding what you can do with it, uh, how far you can go, and... Uh, uh, this kind of stuff. Or for instance, in Belgium, Belgium is for us the country of even more uh, stone architecture than in the Netherlands. I mean, the Netherlands uh, is already about brickwork and the, the, the Belgians are even more like this, you know. So then for us, uh, this is one part and the other part is then the Belgians are about pralines, you know, chocolate. Yeah. <laughs> so <laughs> refined kind of stuff, you know. And that's why we, we thought, yeah, this, this prefab concrete might be something which fits to them, you know. And then, then we started with this concrete works which for us was also a kind of discovery as a kind of yeah, contextual element and also quality element. We also like it. In Holland, it would never have been possible in terms of budget. So, you know, it's, it's a mix of reasons um, which are quite yeah, rational uh, when we use which strategy. You know? uh, I have another question from Denise. She also really appreciated uh, that you speak about the economy of means in architecture. And she's asking if you are applying the economy of means as well when it comes to labor. What I have in mind is whether you have a policy on paid or unpaid internship in your studio. <laughs> That's a funny, funny question. We, you know, we have, we have, we have one coherent salary system. So, <laughs> I mean, we 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 have a salary system which is, um, yeah, unable to pay the the salaries as they are demanded in, in Holland. You know, in the Netherlands, this is quite strictly strictly organized, the salary system. So you have um, you have actually a system which says like, yeah, for this and this profession or this this experience, so and so many years experience, this and this function, you have to pay so and so much. And we, until now, unless we are quite known and we have big projects now, we still were not able to pay uh, according to these rules, so we are still lower than this. So we try to get better and better and better, but we, um, yeah, we, we cannot we cannot pay this. Uh, and, and and trainees uh, internship is in Holland uh, in general not well paid. You know, they, they that's always like for foreigners 450 euros per per month um, brutto, which is then netto nearly. Um, that's the standard here, and we, we, we pay this standard. And if somebody stays longer than half a year, then he's getting more because then he's more experienced and, and can contribute also more efficiently uh, into the office, then we can also pay a bit more money. I have still, uh, it's not enough to make a living. Huh? I mean, you need some other source of income. So. Yeah, yeah, it's understandable. 
I have a few more questions. Um, with regards to the housing crisis in Amsterdam and other Dutch cities, is there any conversation or demands by the muni municipalities about building social housing in the Netherlands? Or can you, um, can you elaborate on your experience with social housing in question there? Um, <clears throat> Holland, Holland had a very, very strong policy on social housing. Uh, in the past, um, it was all kind of standardized. Then in 1990, they uh, privatized the housing corporations, which were state-owned before. Uh, when they privatized the housing corporations, then this whole Dutch architecture explosion took place, uh, where you had all these uh, funny offices like MVRDV uh, coming from, from the OMA, you know, uh, Neutelings, Redijk, and all these kind of offices. Um, then uh, more and more it was neoliberalized. Um, then there was the crash of 2010, and then all this was screwed back. Um, and uh, there is not really a system anymore in this housing policy, which is quite a mess, I would say. So it's not very, yeah, not very structured at the moment. Um, but still, of course, cities demand a percentage of social housing in all projects. So we, we have now, at the moment, we have only one project in the Netherlands. So for the rest, we have uh, just projects abroad uh, for whatever reasons. Um, and in, in this project, for instance, in Amsterdam, uh, there's also the demand of having, like, I think 20% of social housing or something like that. And this is, this is complicated. Um, because, of course, it's totally logic that the city should demand social housing. Uh, so et ethically, uh, socially, of course, it should be this way. Um, at the same time, the city demands uh, a ground price uh, from the developers, but also from housing corporations and fr from whomever, which is sky high, you know. So they have to pay like 3,000 euros per square meter in some areas in Amsterdam just for the ground price. 3,000 per square meter. Yeah. So they're selling, for instance, in Amsterdam for 11,000 euros per square meters. You know, I mean, uh, an apartment of 100 square meters is times 11,000 uh, selling price, uh, 1.1 million. Um, to do social housing in such an economic context where the city is also as capitalist as the developers is, of course, a contradiction in itself, you know. It's just impossible nearly. So that's yeah. why... Uh, the social housing at the, the, the moment in the Netherlands is uh, totally at its limit and not really working because developers are yeah, not able to, to, to offer social housing because the city is demanding also so much ground price also for social housing. You know? So there's a big contradiction in that, uh, which is just due to the fact that everybody is greedy and wants money, including the cities. So yeah. it's quite a complicated situation. Yeah. It's... I hope this answers the question. I mean, um, of, of course, typology-wise, what we do in housing uh, is always rooted in these uh, very high standards in the Netherlands. And we, we, of course, try to work also in other countries, starting from these uh, high standards and adapt these standards then to the local uh, circumstances. And, and, of course, in the Netherlands still, there's a very high level of, of organizing a plan and so on. You know, it's, it's a very, very good quality still. So... But it's quite like um, I would say in some way similar, but not exactly. But there are also this big difference between um, uh, like there are actually no social housing that much, and there are a lot of like a project project uh, of um, developers which are for like um, most of the people maybe not really um, affordable. So, yeah, we are challenging also similar things. Mm -hmm. And maybe the last question, um, I would like to ask you what kind of glass you use in your building that looks so nice and green. Which company made this so big glass mm -hmm. facade? Which building? Which building? Uh, he, he, did, he didn't actually, I think it was during the, um, during the presentation, so... Uh, I didn't really um, uh, catch which which building it was. So you had different companies for uh, uh, when you when you're using uh, uh, windows. Oh, the Glass windows is. in Paris. Yeah. Yeah, the windows in Paris they are from Technal, which is in fact uh, Sapa uh, France. Okay. 
Okay. But you know what they did? They just took uh, an existing system, uh, I think, from, from uh, uh, how they called uh, uh, solar, solar looks or something like that. You know, they took this, this German or Austrian uh, stuff and adapted it slightly to the French context, you know. And then it's about glass thickness that you can use the glass without a uh, frame, which was 15 millimeter glass. Um, and that, that's it, you know, it's quite simple actually. Yeah. Thank you for your time, for the questions, and for your nice presentation. Uh, we were very happy that you took part in our festival this way, and we hope you will visit us <laughs> next year, hopefully. And It'd be really nice. Hmm? We will need to move with our program because we have one more last <laughs> film waiting for us, which is uh, about, um, uh, which is called Block, and it's about the uh, housing estate also in Poland. But uh, Martin will tell us more. Alexander, mm -hmm. thank you very much. Uh, Andre, it's uh, it was a pleasure to have you here. Thank you very much. Okay, thank you. Thank you too for inviting me. We're wishing you all the best. <laughs> okay. Uh, uh, ďakujem pekne. Have a nice event still, eh? Ďakujem pekne, Alexandra. Vďaka.